I want to draw your attention one more week, uh, mention this one more week at least, uh, uh, to the digital notes as we prepare to begin our message today. If you didn't download the notes from the website or you're not uh, hooked in, didn't bring them with you or, or, or whatever, you can go to the website, but you can also go to your Bible app. This is something that we've started doing. Uh, if you have the Bible app on your phone, on your tablet, you can go to the Bible app. If you click on more, and as long as your location services are on, if you click events, Wall Highway Baptist Church pops up. There's an event going on right now. You know that? You're at it. I hope you did. You can, look on, you can click on that event, and the notes, the sermon notes for today will pop up. Uh, if you have an account, if you're signed in, you can make edits. Uh, just make sure you click save, but that's just one other way that we're making the notes uh, available to access. I brought a couple of pictures with me this morning. I want to show you uh, these are different sightings of Jesus and everyday objects. Could we bring the lights down a little bit so we can see these? Is that possible? All right, yeah, that's Jesus in an orange. Can you see at the top? So you make, your, you, you make your decision whether or not that looks like him. Uh, we've got a few more. This is Jesus, uh, the crucifixion on a power pole, I think is what that is. I mean, you can kind of see the crown of thorns there. All right, this is Jesus on a receipt. This one's actually pretty intense. You see the eyeballs? I mean, that's just a receipt. I guess somebody spilled some coffee on it or whatever, and that's how it came out. Some of these are, are pretty amazing, actually. All right, the next one. This is Jesus' face on a cheese pizza. You make your decision. I'm not sure, do you eat the cheese pizza if you get that one? I don't know. All right, the next one. This Two different stains mirror each other, and they both look like the face of Jesus. The big one on the right and the one down on the left. It's kind of creepy, isn't it? I guess it shouldn't be creepy if it's Jesus' face, but still. This is a Google Earth shot, and you can kind of see the outline. Uh, see the nose and the mouth, eyes, uh, the, his right eye on the left up there. So you can sort of see that. What's the next one? Um, this is a pancake. I don't know how much this actually, I don't know. They say it looks like him. You can kind of see it. Yeah, maybe. Supernatural appearances and everyday items. What's the next one? All right, this is a Funyun. Okay. It's important that you understand this is a funion because of what I'm about to tell you. This is supposed to be Mary holding baby Jesus, okay? <laughs> That's not the funny part. This thing sold for $609 on eBay. I'm not joking. $609 for a funion. All right, so everyday items, and y'all have seen those before, right? I mean, you can go home and Google that, and you'll, there'll be, there's a lot more that I didn't show. Um, so you make your, your decision. Is that, did any of those look like Jesus? Was he trying to communicate through everyday items? I, I don't know. That's not the point. The point is, what does it really mean to see Jesus? In, the, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, we read, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for, sa- for they shall, shall see Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Jesus. And this, in, this beatitude is the one that's a little bit of a mystery. It's a little bit hard to understand. What does it really mean to be pure in heart? We know what purity is, but what specifically does it mean to be pure in heart? What does it really mean? What does he mean when he says, you will see Jesus? What, what is he talking about? I mean, if you think about it, we know what it means to be merciful. Um, whether we practice it or not, we know what mercy is. We know what it means to hunger and thirst for, for righteousness. We know what it means to hunger and thirst for something, so we can at least uh, appreciate, understand that. We know what it means to be meek. We can understand what that means. Uh, even if we haven't experienced it ourselves, we know what persecution is, right? Go ahead to the eighth beatitude. So most of the beatitudes you are, are pretty self-explanatory. This one is a little bit of a mystery wrapped inside of a riddle, uh, inside of an, an enigma. I mean, it's kind of a, a strange uh, beatitude, and it takes a little more, it takes digging a little bit deeper to really understand what Jesus is talking about. What is he mean by seeing God? What does he mean to be pure in heart? We, while it is difficult to understand, we can understand enough of it to be able to, to act on it. We can understand a lot more maybe than we think initially. And there's some actions that we should take 
in order to make sure that we become those who are pure in heart, in order to make sure that we put ourselves in a position to be able to truly see God. So that's what we're going to look at. Remember, the Beatitudes were in this series. They describe the inner qualities of a true disciple. They answer two very important questions for us. What does Jesus want from me, and what does Jesus want for me? What does he expect from me? And what does he want for me? The Beatitudes answer both of those questions. It shows us what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower of Christ, to take on the character of Christ. And in that, he's explaining what he wants for us. He wants us to be meek and humble, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, to be pure in heart. And so this morning, let's look at what it means to be pure in heart and how we can put ourselves in a position to be pure in heart and to be able to see God. The first thing we need to do to be pure in heart, to see God, is we need to desire simplicity. We need to desire simplicity. What do we mean? Well, in biblical times, the heart represented the truest self, the truest person person. It was, it was the part of you that feels, that grieves, that has joy. It was the part of you that relates to somebody else. The imagination, where imagination took place. It is where you exercise your freedom to decide, to make choices. That, the heart represented all of that. So when we see the heart described, that's what, what it means here. Uh, it, it's where you decide who you're going to marry. Uh, what you're going to do for a living, uh, the decisions that you make every day. It is, it is the sphere where you meet God and decide whether or not to believe in God, to trust in God. And so the heart represented all of those things. Now, when we talk about the heart, when we speak of the heart, we are talking about the seat of the, motion, of the emotions. Phrases like, I love you with all my heart, come from that, right? I mean, so in biblical times, the primary uh, meaning was it's the real you. For us, it's more like the seat of the emotions. It's emotional, and, and the Bible does talk about it that way. The Bible speaks of the heart that way. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Um, I mean, it is, it's who we are, but it's also our feelings and, and emotions, so what does it mean, with that understanding, what does it mean to be pure in heart? Well, the Greek word for pure is actually the word that we get our word for catheter from. And you think about nurses, you know what a catheter does. It removes impurities. And so that's the idea. To be pure in heart, the idea is that there are impurities that are removed. And so what was once impure has been made pure by the removing of impurities. That's the idea here. To be pure in heart means that there are contaminations that have been removed from my heart. So, a pure heart is one that's been emptied of anything that is unclean or does not belong. So when I say the phrase pure in heart, to be pure in heart, in one sense, Jesus is saying that we need to get rid of everything that contaminates our hearts. And of course, that happens at salvation initially, where we are forgiven of sin. We are justified before God. We are forgiven. The impurities are removed. We are, matter of fact, we're given a brand new heart in Christ. He creates within us a new heart, a clean heart. So the contaminations are removed. The reality is the heart is the source of all of our troubles. Look at Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. And then in Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. All of these things come from inside us and make us impure. Now, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees focused on the outside. They had all these rules and regulations added to the Levitical law that, that dealt with appearances more than anything, doing the right things, earning favor with God, uh, becoming righteous based on what you did. What Jesus is talking about is the reverse of that, the opposite of that. What he's talking about is if you're going to be righteous, if you're going to be pure, it has to start on the inside. You have to be cleaned from the inside out. So with that in mind, a pure in heart, uh, to be pure in heart means to be pure from the inside out. 
starts on the inside, he removes the impurities, he cleans us up, and then he begins to change us from the inside out. Now, we're going to dig a little deeper into that principle in a few moments, but for now, just understand that part of being pure in heart means that I'm cleaned from the inside out. It also means a pure heart is one that is unmixed or unadulterated. Unmixed or unadulterated. Now, think about it this way. When you talk about something being pure gold, you're talking about something that's 100% gold. There's nothing else in it, right? Um, Pure gold. Uh, Several years ago, Ivory had a commercial that said that their soap was 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. But the reality is anything less than 100% is not pure. Pure is 100%. 100% pure gold. Um, You know, anything that's 80% 80 pure fruit juice, not pure, right? 100% is pure. So to be pure is to be 100% something. So in the context of a pure heart, that means that I'm 100% totally devoted to Jesus Christ. There's no, my, my loyalty is not divided. It's not that I, you know, I serve God on Sunday and then I do whatever else I want to do during the week. Or I've got, I'm giving God control of this area of my life, but I'm going to control my family myself or I'll control things at work. It is 100% completely and totally committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 100%. No, not unmixed, not unadulterated, a single devotion. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns us against serving God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24, no one can be a slave of two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. In other words, it doesn't matter whether it's money or anything else. You can't serve two masters. It's one or the other. It's, it's all or nothing. It can't be 50-50, 80-20, whatever. It is a single devotion. So in a sense, being pure in heart means I'm completely and totally devoted to God. A pure heart is also one that is sincere and transparent. It's the real deal. I'm not fake. I'm not putting on airs. I'm not trying to pretend to be holier than I am or to be something that I'm not. I'm real. I'm honest. Uh, There's no hypocrisy. I'm open and honest before God. What you see is what you get. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says. Purity is about cleanliness. It's about removing all of the impurities. It's about being clean from the inside out. It's about having a, a total allegiance to Christ, and it's about being sincere and transparent. So in a very real sense, being pure in heart is about simplifying. It's about simplicity. It's about not pretending, not having too many loyalties, not trying to fix myself from the outside in. It's about giving up and surrendering to God. It's about simplicity, focusing on one thing and removing anything else in my life that would stand in the way of my complete and total devotion or would pull my loyalty away from God and God alone. It's single mind, single heart, single devotion. It's it's like a racehorse. We need blinders on, blocking out anything that would distract us so that we can focus on the prize, on finishing the race, focusing on our Lord and Savior, not letting anything else come into uh, to interference with that, to interfere with that. Anything else come into play. Think about Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Jesus was visiting, and we see a heart that's pure and a heart that's distracted. And Jesus addresses this in in Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Martha scolds Mary for not helping her prepare a meal. Martha's doing all these things, and, and the Lord says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary's focused on the right thing. She's focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm pure in heart, I'm not going to let myself be carved up into a thousand pieces. I'm not going to let myself be pulled in a million different directions in terms of my devotion and my loyalty. First and foremost, and most importantly, I'm going to be focused on Christ. Everything else in my life will come, will be filtered through that. He will be at the center of my life, and every decision I make, every action I take, will be based on his direction, his lordship, his leadership. You know, even in our world, our scattered brains, there are things that happen that, 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 that get our complete attention. 
don't they? If your child screams in the middle of the night, that's the only thing you can think about in that moment. You want to know what's wrong. Um, they get hurt outside on the playground, you're focused. The doctor tells you you may have cancer. You're focused on that and that alone, right? Hopefully that doesn't happen, but things like that in our world. You know, uh, something dramatic, drastic happens, and you, you lose your job. That's all you can think about. Your focus is there. Right? There are things that happen to us all the time that grab our attention. And, and those temporary things, bad, some of them difficult, yes, not minimizing if you're going through any of those things. But if, if temporary things can grab our attention like that, how much more should the God of the universe be able to hold our attention? I mean, part of being pure in heart is just focus. Focus is everything in life. Part of being pure in heart is focusing on the one thing that matters, being, being intensely, singularly focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Purity of heart is to focus on one thing, but it needs to be the right thing. It can't just be anything. It needs to be the right thing. And that's why, number two, we need to desire the right things. If part of being pure in heart is focusing on one thing, it can't just be any one thing. It needs to be the right thing. And if you want to fall away from God, if you want to backslide, the best way to do that is to get caught up in flashy things and temporary things and things that are impressive and fame, fortune, you know, possessions, all of those things which in and of themselves aren't bad. But if, if that's where our loyalties are, if that's our main focus, then you're going to be distracted. So if you want to be distracted, focus on temporary things. But the pure in heart want the one thing that is genuinely and enduringly good. In this beatitude, Jesus is promising us what we all really want, what we all desire. He, he promises us that we can see God, to be near God. You know, the Bible tells us God has set eternity in the hearts of man. Pascal talks about the God-shaped hole that's in all of us. Augustine talks about how our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. We are all built hardwired to know our creator. There's a, there's a desire in each of us to know our creator. We try to define the creator in a lot of different ways. We try to fill that void in many different ways. You know, nature doesn't like a vacuum. It's going to get filled with something if we don't intentionally fill it with God. But the void is there because of sin, because we've been separated from God. And so there's this void, and we want to see God. We want to know God. We want to be known by God. We are hardwired that way. And, and you, don't, you don't have to look very hard in our world to find things that interfere with that. You know, talking about a pure heart, it doesn't take long to find impurities. Turn on the television, watch the news, read the newspaper, um, you know, just walk around for a little while and listen to conversations that are going on. Look at the magazines on the rack in the checkout line at the grocery store. I mean, there are impurities everywhere uh, in our language, in our culture, um, and in the movies and TV shows and everything, things that we allow into our homes, there's impurity everywhere. It surrounds us. And, and, and part of the lure of it is that impurity seems to pay. I mean, if we look around and we see people in the world that get ahead, it's usually not the meek, right? It's usually not those who, who put, their, put others' needs above themselves. It's not, we wouldn't consider it to be those who are being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. I mean, it's the people that are ruthless, who do whatever it takes to succeed. We see those people with lots of money and lots of fame and lots of fortune. So there's this, there's a lure there. There's an idea that, that if you're willing to bend the rules, if you're willing to cut a few corners to get ahead, you'll reap the benefits. And so part of our problem with this is that what we see in our world seems to contradict what Jesus is teaching. And it does if you measure success on earthly terms, on temporary terms. But look at what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 73, verses 1 and 2, and verse 14. He says, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped, my steps went astray. And then you jump to 14. He says, I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. I mean, this guy's kept a pure heart. It's not like he's, he's living in sin uh, intentionally. I mean, he's done the right things. He's saying, I've kept a pure heart, 
But, I mean, he's been faithful, he's been good, he's been all of those things, but he's been rewarded, it appears, with suffering, physical pain, difficulties. That's been his reward. So he's saying, God, I know you're good, but (laughs) it really doesn't feel that way right now. It feels like I'm being punished for being good, for being faithful, for being rewarded. But then he sees something very important that we all need to understand. The belief that the good are rewarded and the wicked are always punished in this life is fiction. You won't always be rewarded for what you do in this life. And the wicked won't always be punished in this life. One day they will. They'll be held, held, either they'll come to Christ and be justified as we are, all of us who know Christ, or they'll be punished in eternity. But we, we've got this idea that, you know, if I come to Christ, everything I do will be just peachy. My life will be in order, and then I'll be rewarded for every good thing I do. But that's not always the case in this life, because if, you, if that is the case, then you've got to take off the eighth beatitude. Can't have it. Because there's persecution involved. Many times it's the opposite. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying, I've done good, but I'm suffering. I've been faithful, but I'm suffering. But then something happens. He goes, in verse 17, he enters God's temple. He goes into the presence of God, and his entire perspective changes. Just being in the temple, being in the presence of God, he catches a glimpse of hope. His attitude, his heart changes. And the presence of God can do amazing things in people's lives. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, whatever suffering, whatever trial, whatever tribulation, let me encourage you, run into the arms of God. The presence of God can completely change your perspective. He's not miraculously healed. He's still hurting. He's still suffering. None of that has changed. But now he says with certainty that God is good to the pure in heart. Look at verse 26 of Psalm 73. My flesh and my heart may fail. Nothing's changed there. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Even if they're getting ahead right now, God, you see it, you know it. You are righteous, you will judge. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. What had changed? Look again at verse 28. How is he assured that God is good? God's presence is my good. The presence of God. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God being close to God. Is part of what we desire. He's not some cashier in the sky that rings up our good deeds and our bad deeds and he calculates. Thankfully, we'd all be in trouble if we're honest. It's not that we're trying to build up the score so that when he judges, we come out on the good side. It's not that, you know, he pays out with big pats on the back and thank yous in this life. I mean, yeah, he he does that more than we deserve, but that's not what we're in it for. That's not what we're looking for. God is the one whose love never fails. God is the one who is forever faithful, who is always constant in the midst of chaos and turmoil and suffering and pain. God is there. He is good. It's not something he does, it's who he is. God is love. And it's not dependent upon the pleasantness of my circumstances as to whether or not he's good. He's compassionate, he's wise, and he's tender. And because of that, we have a desire to be near him. And that's number three. The pure in heart have a desire to be near God, to be near him. You know, God God is good, but the the good that God is is not a thing. It's a person. It's him. It's who he is. It's it's not that he gives us something that's good. He gives us himself. And there is no substitute for the presence of God. Again, the, the thing that changed the psalmist's perspective was being in the presence of God. There's no substitute for that. There's nothing he could give that would substitute for that. He is the best gift himself. So to be pure in heart... And the very real sense is to be near God. It is to be close to God. 
to know his presence, to feel his presence. God is good to the pure in heart. Being pure in heart isn't about just doing good things or bad things. It's not about, I mean, it, it results in, in doing good things, but, but that's not what it's about. Matter of fact, Bonhoeffer suggested that the pure in heart are those whose hearts are undefiled by their own evil and by their own virtues. In other words, I don't depend too much on my own abilities. Remember the Pharisees, they had built this system where it was all about following the rules and, and, and doing the right things and making themselves look good. Jesus confronted that head on. And so it's not about what I do that's good. It's, it's not about good work. So, so what comes out of the pure in heart? Well, the pure in heart, love. Love comes from the pure in heart. Jim Forrest makes the point that not only did Jesus say, not say, blessed are the pure in mind, but he also did not say, blessed are the brilliant in mind. So it's not about what I do. It's not about how much I know. It's not about how much I've accomplished. It's not about how smart I am or not, like thereof. It's not really about anything that I do on my own. It's about what God does through me. Being pure in heart isn't about doing the right things. It's talking about what Jesus is talking about here is a condition of the heart. Remember, what was once impure is made pure. He cleans us up, gives us a new heart. He puts his presence in our lives. And what comes from that is the character of Christ. And one of those characteristics is certainly love. So the question for us is, what's the condition of our heart? What's the condition of your heart, my heart? I mean, when someone barks at you, do you just bark right back? You repay evil for evil? If, if you're offered gossip, do you reject it or do you pass it on? I mean, if, if you're somebody slandering somebody, do you jump right in there so maybe you feel a little bit better about yourself or do you, do you take a stand for what's right? Do you see somebody that's hurting or homeless as an opportunity to show the love of Christ or as a nuisance to be avoided? I mean, just a couple of extreme examples. You know, everyday things that happen to us can give us a little bit of an indication of the condition of our hearts. I mean, you know, what, what's, what's coming out every day as we live our lives? The state of my heart dictates whether I harbor a grudge or give grace, whether I seek self-pity or seek Christ. Whether I drink human misery or taste God's mercy, the condition of my heart. We need to pray like David did. Lord, create in me a pure heart, a clean heart, a new heart. But we usually reverse the order. We try to fix the outside first and then hoping that that takes care of the inside. Now, I'm officially middle-aged now, I think. You, some middle-aged guys have a midlife crisis. Mandy told me I wasn't allowed to have one, so... You know, a guy faces middle age, he's suddenly depressed, and what does he do? Oh, go buy a brand new sports car, right? I should at least get to do that, shouldn't I? You know, I mean, that, 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 that makes him happy for a little while, right? Until the newness wears off. Guy's struggling at work, he's getting a little bit older maybe, he's not on the cutting edge, and his boss tells him, you need to change your look, change your style, flash some cash, you know, get a new hairstyle, new clothes. You'll sell more if you look more modern. So he changes his style, and everything's great until the style changes, right? And, you know, there, there's, there, there are things that we try to do externally to make ourselves feel better. You know, buying something new, doing something, if I can only get that new house, or if I can only meet the right person, or, or whatever. Things that we try to do to fix the brokenness inside. But the reality is, there's only one thing, one person, or one thing that's going to change your life, and that's a brand new heart, and there's only one person that can give it to you, and that's Jesus Christ. He cleans us up from the inside out. Think about it this way. Think about it like this this, a lot of us try to fix our lives like this toothpaste too, right? You, you got toothpaste on the inside, and how do you get it out? Well, you squeeze from the outside, and it comes out. And you keep on, keep on, what's eventually going to happen? Waste. Yeah, it is. I'm wasting toothpaste. I'm sorry. So what's going to happen? Eventually, you're, it's empty. You're allowing... The world to conform you or your, your, your pressure from the outside, you're changing the outside and you're affecting the inside, but you end up with emptiness. That's all you end up with. 
Well, you compare that with a balloon, all right? Next to water, this is my second favorite illustration. Have y'all guessed that? <laughs> How do you change a balloon? It's from the inside. If I don't pass out, I'm going to blow this balloon up. <coughs> Kids are over there hoping I do pass out. Y'all are mean. So from the inside, the balloon has been changed. You fill the balloon with air, and suddenly, man, this, we could have some fun with this, right? I'm not going to do it because, you know, social distancing, but we could pass it around. We could knock this thing around a little bit. We could have fun. This thing has been changed for the better while this has been changed for the worse. And that's what happens. When I try to fix myself from the outside in, this is how I'm going to be left. I'm going to be left empty. Nothing's really going to change. It may change temporarily. I may feel good for a little while, but I'm going to be left empty and with a mess. That's all that's going to happen. But if I allow Christ to come in, if I surrender to him, if I submit to him, if I realize there's nothing I can do to change myself and I let him take control, he changes me from the inside out. And suddenly my life is different eternally. That change never fades. And that's what creates hope. That's what creates comfort. That's what creates that sense of security, eternal security, being near God, allowing him to be close to us. The toothpaste serves a dual purpose. The balloon won't go anywhere. <laughs> you like that? Allowing Christ to change me from the inside out, a change of heart that results in a changed life. Purity of heart is a childlike faith and simplicity. It's simply coming to Christ, accepting him, and surrendering my life to him completely. And remember, now the, the Beatitudes are like a ladder or a set of stairs, right? One leads to the next. So I, I realize my poverty before God. I mourn over sin. I humble myself. I hunger and I thirst for righteousness. I practice mercy. I experience mercy. I practice mercy. And then suddenly, God has begun the process I'm justified before God immediately, but then there's that process of sanctification where he's molding me. He's shaping me. So I'm immediately given a new heart. I'm clean from the inside out, but then he continues to work on me, and I become more and more like him, but it's a process. One leads to the next. I'll never get to this point to where I'm pure in heart if I don't first realize my spiritual poverty before God, that I need those impurities removed. And if I don't humble myself, mourn over sin, and humble myself and surrender to God and experience, accept his mercy, I'll never be pure in heart because I haven't recognized my need for salvation. And God won't force himself on us. But blessed are those who are pure in heart because they desire one thing. They desire Christ. They simplified their lives. You know, if I have, like Paul, I've known how to live with a lot and a little. If I have it, great. If I don't, it's okay, too, because I've got the one thing that matters. I've got Jesus. I've got his presence, and his presence makes all the difference. Blessed are those who have a deep walk with God that allows him to transform your life from the inside out. If I'm pure in our heart, I will also, number four, have a desire to see God. I want to be near God, and I want to see God. But then there, there again, it begs the question, what does it mean to see God? What does he say? I mean, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But, but you've got to notice the order here, right, with this beatitude. First, pure heart, then you see God. Jesus and sin, God and sin can't coexist, so your heart has to be pure, then you can see God. So it must be the impurities in my life that blind me. If I'm not seeing God, it's because there's impurity, more than likely. There's something that, that needs to be cleansed, maybe... Maybe it's that you need to, to mourn a little bit. Maybe you need to mourn over your sin, be cleansed from sin. Maybe it's poverty. You know, nothing clears things up. So, like, like understanding that nothing I have matters and recognizing my spiritual poverty before God, recognizing that my best efforts are filthy rags in His presence. So maybe it's a little bit of spiritual poverty. Maybe, maybe it's fasting. You know, maybe literally fasting like we did a few weeks ago or, or hungering and thirsting for righteousness, which is one of the, part, the, the focuses, one of the purposes of fasting, right? So I'll focus on the Lord, and I'll recognize that I need him more than food and water itself. 
So, so maybe it's spiritual fasting or literal fasting. Maybe if I could simplify my life, if I could get rid of all the distractions and focus on Jesus like we're talking about today, maybe, maybe that would clear things up. What, what is it? If you're having trouble seeing God, what's, what's affecting your vision? What is it that's standing in the way? Because something is. Because Jesus promises if we draw close to him, he will draw close to us. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see me. They will see God. So if I'm not seeing God, if I'm not experiencing in my life, then something's standing in the way. We need to free it up. We need available space. One thing we need to understand is that no one sees God in his essence. Maybe there's some confusion. You're not going to see God directly in this life. You wouldn't be able to live to tell about it if you did. His glory would drop, you would drop dead in his presence. I mean, we see in John 1.18 that no one has seen God at any time. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God dwells in inapproachable light. Even Moses, who spoke with God face to face, so to speak, in, in Numbers chapter 12, he never saw God in his essence. He only saw the backside of God, and it nearly killed him. We, we, we won't see God directly. Uh, you know, the, the, the appearances of Jesus in a pancake is not seeing God, all right? We've got depictions of what we think he looks like, but his glory is too much for our minds to comprehend. So we're not going to see him directly. No one can see God directly. You know, in the early years of the space race, a Soviet cosmonaut, when he came back to earth, he said he looked out, uh, out of the capsule, and he came back and he said he didn't see God anywhere. He wanted to see God. He said he didn't see God anywhere. And W.A. Crystal said something. It's a pretty, pretty quick-witted response. He said, let him step outside his space suit for one second, and he'll see God soon enough. <laughs> but that's the point, right? We won't see God like that in this life, but we will see him face-to-face -face in heaven. And so we're talking about seeing God. Yes, there is a sense where we see him in this life, but it's not directly. We couldn't handle it. I mean, we're just, we're too sinful. I mean, we're human beings. We couldn't, we could not handle it. We wouldn't be able to live to tell the story. So how do we see him? It's not seeing him in his essence, not seeing him directly. So we need to understand that there, that there are ways we can, we can see God. So how is that? Well, it, some, part of it depends on what we're able to see. You know, what am I looking for? You know, what kind of condition is my heart in? And when we went to China, both times I've been to China, I learned a few Chinese words, but, you know, I didn't even attempt to learn to read Chinese. I mean, and when I look at Chinese, I see characters, pictures. But when they look at it, they see words and sentences, and it makes sense to them. Um, Gracie's learning Spanish. Eventually, she'll be able to make sense of that. Someone who doesn't speak Spanish, it doesn't make sense. Someone who doesn't speak English, I'm talking gibberish, Right? It's all in what you know, what you're able to see, what you're able to understand. And so if I'm not in a condition spiritually to be able to see God, then I'm, I'm just not going to be able to see him. So part of it has to do with what I'm able to see. In life, we're only able to see, or we can only see what we're able to see. And we only see what we're looking for. You know, some of us may not be seeking the Lord. We may not, we may not be seeing him because we're just not seeking him. We're not spending time in his word. We're not spending time with him. And then that explains why a lot of us never see God, because we're not looking for him in the first place. You know, this explains why a lot of people didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't recognize him as the Messiah. They were looking for something else. They didn't see him. He was right in front of them. And they didn't recognize him because they were looking for something else. They weren't looking for him, truly. In the spiritual realm, as with all of life, you only see what you're looking for. And we know that we will see God in heaven in his essence, but that doesn't mean we can't see him now. So how do we see him? What ways? In what ways do we see God? Well, for one thing, we can see God in our neighbor. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus, his last lesson, he told us that, that we see his face in, in the eyes of the poor, in the hungry, in the homeless, in the imprisoned. Matthew 25, 45, he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did, do, did not do for, for the, one of the least of these, you did not do for me either. I mean, we see, if we look, we see him in the needy. Mother Teresa spoke on this idea all over the world. She said this. She said, at the end of life, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, 
how much money we have made or how many great things we have done. We will be judged by, I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was naked and you clothed me. I was homeless and you took me in. The pure in heart love Jesus and they want to be close to Jesus. And one of the ways to be close to Jesus is to be close to the people he was close to. The poor, the needy, the hurting. And the, the people that are in need and recognize their need. And so one of the ways we can see Christ is to be close to those who are in need. Another way we see God in this life is by living the life that he calls us to live. Living a life of obedience. Pure lives of obedience made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. In Psalm 18, verse 20 through 26, David says, The Lord reward me rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I've kept all of his ordinances in my mind and have not disregarded his statutes. I was blameless toward him and kept myself from sinning. So the Lord repaid me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the faithful, you prove yourself faithful, and with the blameless man, you prove yourself blameless. With the pure, you prove yourself pure, but with the crooked, you prove yourself shrewd. So what, what we are determines what we see. How I live my life determines what I'm able to see, whether or not I'm able to truly see God. Living pure lives allows us to experience God's presence in new ways every day. So a lot of it has to do with how am I living my life. In this context, seeing God means having a deep experience with God, having a, an intimate relationship with God that's growing each day. Each day I'm becoming more like Him. Personal. But transparency is what leads to intimacy. If you want to be close to your spouse, you need to be honest and open with them. Transparent. Nothing will divide a couple like lies, betrayal. If I want to be close to God, I've got to be real before. He already knows, but a lot of times we try to hide things from him. As foolish as it sounds, we do it. We all do it. So one step to being intimate with God is just being transparent, being open. Open about my sin, open about my faults. My insecurities, all of those things, allowing him to fill me with his presence daily and to be strong where I am weak, being completely humble and open before God will allow us to experience him personally, daily submitting myself to him, opening myself up to him and his will for my life. So there are two ways we can understand this beatitude, two ways. In this life, a pure heart means a deep walk with God, a deep close, intimate relationship with God. In eternity, a pure heart means a new experience of God. So we can see him in this life, experience him, but we have that day to look forward to. Well, we will see him face to face, and we will be captured in his glory for all of eternity. We'll be in his presence, and there will be no sin, nothing keeping us from God at all. Nothing affecting our vision at all. Nothing to distract us. It'll be his presence. And we'll be perfect in his presence. This is what David means in Psalm 24 when he asks, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. God cleans us from the inside out. In 1960, President Eisenhower gave the State of the Union address, and he talked about this 11-nation tour that he had previously done in 1959. He spoke about how he would meet with leaders from different countries, and they would talk about how they had taken little excerpts from our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and used it for their government. They had picked things that they admired about the United States and used it to build their own government. And he said in his speech, in response to that, he said, our very action must be to strive to make ourselves worthy of this trust, ever mindful that an accumulation of seemingly minor encroachments upon freedom gradually could break down the entire fabric of a free society. Now, I'm not going to get political, but I, I do worry about minor encroachments on our freedom that we experience today, and, and they, are, they are everywhere. And the more we allow that, the more in jeopardy we are. And listen, there are people that fought and died for our freedom, and we should honor their memory by fighting to protect that freedom. And we should never take that for granted. Okay, so hear me. But what about our spiritual freedom? Are we allowing 
minor encroachments on our spiritual freedom? Are we allowing minor impurities to exist in our lives? Things that we would consider to be harmless in the grand scheme, but are we allowing, oh, well, we'll we're okay with that. We'll allow that. Because those little bitty things, like encroachments on freedom in a very real sense, physical sense, spiritually, those little encroachments build up. And if we allow them to go unchecked before we know it, we can't see God at all. We haven't experienced him, and I don't know when. I don't remember what it's like to be in his presence because it's been so long. I've allowed all this stuff to clutter up my life, and those we have to guard fiercely, fiercely protect the freedom that we have in Christ. Not that our salvation is dependent upon us. That's not what I'm saying. But our relationship, the, the intimacy of our relationship with God, God allows us to have a choice in that. And if we don't choose him, if we don't choose surrender, if we don't choose to let him be in control, then we will never become what he wants us to become in terms of spiritual maturity. We have to allow him to work on us, to continue to work on us from the inside out, to clean us up, to make us what he wants us to be. His life, his way, his will, not mine. We can't allow those things to cause us to be pulled away from him. Our freedom to see God in his work and, in, and in work in our lives. These things are all in jeopardy when we allow sin to creep in. When we chase after the wrong things instead of seeking the Lord first, instead of seeking his kingdom first and his righteousness, instead of focusing on him and, and advancing his kingdom, we will be unable to see God. And the reality is we haven't been set free to do whatever we want. We've been set free of sin to serve him. And to glorify him. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says, for they shall see God. The blessing is just that. We see and experience God. And I pray that we will never be satisfied with anything less than a deep, intimate relationship with God. But you got to know him in order to experience it. God offers, Jesus offers salvation. God offers it through his son, Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if you will invite him into your life, Ask him to forgive you of your sin. He will set you free from sin. And, and you will begin this journey of becoming more like him where you're in a position to be able to see him and experience him and experience his will for your life. So if you're here today or you're at home and you haven't invited Christ into your life, I, I encourage you to do that. He, he's waiting with open arms to receive you. If you're here today and you know Christ, if you're at home and you know Christ and, and you're having trouble seeing God because there's too much clutter in your life, we're going to have a time of prayer, and I just encourage you to lay that at his feet. Whatever it is that he brings to your mind that's standing in the way between you experiencing him and his best for you, you lay it at his feet. You confess it. Turn from it. Repent. Turn to him, and he will continue that process of making you more like himself. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you recognizing that in order to be pure in heart, we can't do that on our own. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't make ourselves right. You have to do that. Only you can give us a new heart, but you offer it. Jesus, through your death on the cross, paying the price for our sins, through your, your burial, your resurrection, defeating death and, and offering us the same, freedom from sin and death. If we will invite you into our lives and and if we will ask you to forgive us of sin surrender our lives to you you will do just that you'll forgive us and free us and lord i pray that if there's someone here today who's never done that or someone watching from wherever they are who's never invited you into their life who's never who's never experienced that freedom from sin i pray that they would pray right now and, and ask you to do just that for those of us who know you lord are we pursuing you every day are we focused on you? Are we completely and totally, is our devotion single? Are we totally devoted to you? Or do we have divided allegiances? Are we trying to divide our loyalties between you and whatever else in our lives that we think is important? Are we trying to run parts of our lives and, and then submit to you in other areas of our lives? Lord, you require complete devotion. You require total humility, total submission. You're either Lord of all or not at all. We have to surrender, and I pray that we would do that in this moment. Not just in this moment, each day as we begin the day 
I pray that we would begin it with surrender and submission to you. And if we do that, if we're committed to you and we focus on you and we follow your will for our lives, if we allow you to lead God and direct us and to accomplish your purpose, we will never regret it because we will truly see you in our lives as we serve others, as we experience your presence. Lord, your presence changes everything. As we experience you in our lives, working through us, doing things that we could never do on our own, as we see you use us to advance your kingdom, even though you don't need us, you use us. As we experience those things, we will never regret surrendering to you. Always looking forward to the day that we will see you face to face. The promise of being in your presence for all of eternity. We work in the present with an eye toward eternity, maintaining that eternal perspective, knowing that one day everything that we're working toward, everything that you're building will be complete. God, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you for being patient with us and continuing to work on us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.